Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm at the University of Ottawa, Laboratory for Paleoclimatology, and uh, Carleton University, the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. In uh, this uh, particular video, I'm going to talk about some of the work of Paul J. Kreutzen, um, a uh, Springer um, book basically came out in uh, 2016 talking about the man and his work. Um, he, he won the Nobel Prize in 1995 um, he, he, for basically his work with ozone um, atmospheric uh, chemistry and physics uh, to determine the problem that was occurring with the ozone hole. Um, he also coined the phrase the Anthropocene, the age of humans. So I'm going to talk about how some of the work that he's done and thinking that he's done on using sulfur in the stratosphere to, uh, to mitigate climate change, to basically uh, get the warming um, under control, giving us time, um, which I say is to completely retool uh, fossil fuels as leg one of the three-legged bar stool and do carbon dioxide removal to lower the CO2 levels, which are pushing at 410 parts per million, turning the ocean acidic, threatening the food chain, and also causing tremendous warming on the planet. I'm just going to get the lights for contrast. Okay, so I believe this is an open source document. Um, if you go and you look at the um, table of contents, um, there's a lot of personal history um, from this uh, gentleman. He talked a lot about nuclear winter, about ash and soot in the upper atmosphere sent aloft in the event of a nuclear exchange and how that would cool the planet and be very harmful to the uh, global food supply. Um, 1995, he got the Nobel Prize, um, mostly, like I said, from his ozone work. So there's lots of stuff. There's a bibliography of all of his books and publications. There's his work on nitrogen oxides on the atmospheric ozone content, biomass burning at the um, biomass burning as a source of atmospheric gases. This is mostly at, in equatorial regions, the atmosphere after a nuclear war. So the simulations and scenarios of nuclear winter um, and this can be related to massive forest fires, which put up lots of soot, but over longer periods of time rather than in, in abrupt exchanges. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, stuff on the tropospheric uh, photochemistry, you know, how light um, breaks down different molecules and inhibits or um, causes various chemical reactions to occur, complex chemical reactions to occur. How the ozone is, how the ozone hole occurs in the southern hemisphere over Antarctic, uh, biomass burning in the tropics, and the effect of the particles and soot and black carbon and all these other things that add aerosols to the atmosphere. Um, how sea salt aerosols generally uh, produce halogens that produce low-level clouds and things. Um, and now, what I'm going to talk about mostly is this, the albedo enhancement by stratospheric sulfur injection. Can we resolve the policy dilemma? Okay, and, the la and there's also nitrous oxide release from biofuel or agro-biofuel production, um, which can be harmful. Um, it could negate global warming reduction by replacing fossil fuels. So, um, I'm going to talk about all these, so I want to go to... I want to go to chapter 11, which is 217, if I can find it. Um, where are we? Which chapter are we on? There's 12, there we go, 11, I guess is here, here we go. Okay, so, so fossil fuel burning releases about 25 petagram so this is 10 to the 15th grams of CO2 per year into the atmosphere, which leads to global warming, okay? This was a few years ago, the number's higher now. It also emits 55 teragrams of sulfur as SO2 per year. Now about half of that is converted to sulfate particles, which stay aloft. The remainder are 
particles what are that are powders that are dry deposited on the land surface. So only about half of that, only about 27 teragrams or so, goes up into the um, into the atmosphere. The rest is dry deposited, and this is in the lower atmosphere. So the warming of the Earth from the increased greenhouse gases is partially countered or modulated by some backscattering to space from solar radiation by the sulfate particles. They also act as cloud condensation nuclei and they, in, they influence the microphysical and optical properties of clouds. So they affect regional precipitation patterns, the cloud reflectivity, right? Smaller particles make brighter clouds, the Tuomi effect, and they also increase the lifetime of clouds. Smaller particles in clouds are less likely to precipitate out. So, so these um, anthropogenically enhanced sulfate particles, they cool the planet somewhat, offsetting an uncertain fraction, uncertain fraction, notice it says, of the anthropogenic increase in greenhouse gas warming. Okay, but this um, coincidence um, is bought at a substantial price. According to WHO, the, uh, there's more than 500,000 premature deaths per year worldwide. That was uh, a while ago. And by the acid precipitation and deposition, the SO2 and sulfates cause ecological damage. Okay, so we have to slash those, and we're doing it. Um, after earlier rises in global SO2, um, we've reduced um, sulfate loading has been declining at the rate of about 2.7% per year. So this is where we went from the global dimming situation to a global brightening situation from about 1980 or so onward. Okay, so this increase, this global brightening, increase in solar radiation by about 0.1% per year from 1983 to 2001 contribute to large climate warming. Now the point is, is solar spot variation, sunspot variation is about 0.01, is, is much less than this. Um, it varies over a cycle of 11 years by about this amount. So every year on a year basis, it varies mostly by about 0.01 or about 10 times smaller than this particular um, change um, from, from the aerosols. So this uh, does improve uh, the, so according to this model from about 10 years ago, complete improvement of air quality, complete reduction of all sulfur dioxide, it could lead to a decadal global average air temperature increase by, so over, over 10 years, by 0.8 degrees K, Kelvin, that's the same as 0.8 Celsius, increase over most continents, and up to 4K in the Arctic, and we know that the Arctic changes more from Arctic temperature amplification. Okay, so that's the sort of numbers that we're talking about according to this particular study, 0.8 Kelvin, uh, 0.8 degrees Celsius rise if we suddenly got rid of all of those, all of the, uh, um, aerosol emissions, but this study doesn't really talk about the black carbon versus uh, sulfur dioxide components. It doesn't break it down, and we know from recent work that the black carbon is actually contributing a lot to warming itself, uh, so we're removing that black carbon will cool, you know, we'll get rid of that heating of the atmosphere from the carbon absorption, whereas the sulfur dioxide reflects the incoming long wave or, or shortwave radiation from the sun um, and doesn't cause the heating of the atmosphere because most of its light's reflected, it's not absorbed, whereas the black carbon or soot does absorb it, you know, very dark surface. Okay, so the best way to resolve this is to lower emissions of greenhouse gases, but attempts to do this have been grossly unsuccessful. You know, we talk about it, we beat every year, you know, Lima a few years ago, Paris, you know, uh, Marrakesh, just every year, you know, big meetings and the levels still go up and up and up in the atmosphere. So to stabilize CO2, we'd have to reduce 60 to 80 percent, at least from emissions. Um, and that's just not happening. So if we're not going to do that, 
we, uh, we, then, then we don't have a lot of choice, okay? We have to artificially enhance the Earth albedo, um, reflectivity, and cool the climate by adding sunlight reflecting aerosol up into the stratosphere, you know, for SRM. This is, this is uh, you know, this, is, this would, would do the trick. So what materials do we use? Well, let's look at uh, sulfur for, you know, sulfur is an obvious material. If we burn S2 or H2S up in the stratosphere or burned it on the ground and carried it into the stratosphere on balloons, um, they say by artillery guns, yeah, right, I don't know about that. I think uh, putting it sulfur into uh, commercial aviation fuel the planes fly up at the right altitude. When they burn, the jet engines would re release the sulfur. It could be quantified very easily, and it wouldn't basically change the way we do things. It would just change the type of fuel that these aircraft carry, that these aircraft burn. Um, now, to increase the residence time of the material and minimize the required mass, um, the, uh, these reactants could be put also in the tropical upward branch of the stratospheric circulation system and then global circulation would carry them up there. Um, once the sulfur dioxide is in the stratosphere, it's broken down. There's various um, chemical, microphysical, solar processes that break it down and convert the sulfate particles. Now, Pinatubo in 19, June 1991 injected some 10 teragrams of sulfur initially as SO2 into the tropical stratos stratosphere. Okay, um, it cooled the planet. So 10, remember that number, 10 teragrams of sulfur. Um, the planet cooled a half a degree for three years. The, stu the stuff stayed up there. Okay, so a couple of things. The volcano is putting all different sizes of sulfates up there. The heavier ones are going to be pulled by gravity out of the stratosphere pretty quickly. The smaller ones stick around longer. If we were injecting it up there ourselves, we would have all small uh, size particles which are going to stay up the longest in the stratosphere. Um, we would only be using a fraction of these type of amounts. Remember, compare that 10 teragrams to the 55 teragrams of sulfur that annually we put into the lower atmosphere. Okay, so. Um, the great advantage of placing these reflective particles in the stratosphere is a long residence time of one to two years compared to a week in the troposphere. So they last, they're pulled down by gravity from the stratosphere. As soon as they hit the troposphere, they're rained out in about a week, but it takes about one to two years to pull them down by gravity. The larger particles come down faster. So if you put all smaller particles in there, you can increase the residence time. Much less sulfur, only a few percent would be required in the stratosphere to get similar cooling as the tropospheric aerosols. Okay, so we could reduce air pollution near the ground, improve ecological conditions, and reduce the climate warming. The main issue is, you know, is it in, you know, there's other, there's issues we have to look at, make sure there's no significant side effects on ozone. So let's look at the metrics. So one teragram of sulfur in the stratosphere has an average vertical optical depth so AOD, absorption optical depth of about 0 0.007, and that's, so that's 0.7% 0, that's 0 in the visible. That corresponds to a, a sulfur mixing ratio of one nanomole per mole of air. So the, ratio, the concentration, that's one part per billion, essentially. Uh, one molecule in 10 to the ninth one part per billion, which is about six times the natural background. So we're talking about very low concentrations of sulfur in the stratosphere to do the job. Extremely low concentrations compared to what we have in the lower atmosphere and breathe in and have, causes all these fatalities, half a million people per year. Okay, so based on the effect from Mount Pinatubo of what that 10 teragram did, we can calculate um, these numbers. and. I'm going to um, do these calculations. I'll start here in the next video and do these calculations. Please have a look, check out my website, paulbeckwith.net, and please consider a financial donation to support my videos and my work, because that's, that's what I rely on. Thank you.